Hi, everyone. Welcome to this month's webinar. I'm Christina Hubner, and I am the manager of our client services team here at Sawtooth Software. Today's webinar is highlights and learnings from the 2021 Sawtooth Conference, Sawtooth Software Conference. Our presenter will be Brian Oram and Keith Shun. Brian Orm is the current CEO and president at Sawtooth Software, where he has worked for the past 26 years. He's the recipient of the American Marketing Association's Parlin Award in 2017 for leadership in marketing sciences. Keith Shun is the senior VP of Sawtooth Analytics, a division of Sawtooth Software that serves our clients with paid consulting services. He has been a prolific writer and conference speaker in the field of choice analytics over the last 30 plus years. Brian and Keith recently teamed up to write two books on conjoint analysis and max diff scaling. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window to ask questions. If we have time towards the end, we will take time to answer some questions live. You can also always feel free to reach out to our SAW2 software support after the webinar. With that, we will turn the time over to Brian. Take it away, Brian. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Keith and I are real pleased to be here to talk to you about some of the findings and things that we took away from the 2021 Sati Software Conference. Now we hold our conference annually. And last year, this last year, we were in San Antonio, Texas. The papers at the conference are selected via an open call for papers. And we had about two dozen papers presented over two days that mostly focused on conjoint and max diff and market segmentation type topics. And we're gonna highlight findings from eight of the papers that were particularly meaningful to us. The presentations we're gonna review are as follows. Keith is going to review the odd numbered presentations here and I'll review the even presentations. With that, I'll turn it over to Keith to talk about identifying bad respondents in Max Diff. Thanks, Brian. Okay, this paper comes to us from Jane Tang, Mona Foss, and Rosanna Mao at Bootstrap Analytics. Um, go to the, you can go to the next slide. So the paper is about identifying random respondents in, uh, in choice experiments, or particularly in this case, in max diff experiments. And so they, they identify a bad respondent as someone who's answering the survey randomly. And two of the methods that they're gonna to use to identify random respondents involve what they call automated test respondents. These are robots that we program to answer the survey randomly. Um, and so in one of the methods, they're gonna just, they're gonna create some of these robots they're going to analyze them with HB. They're going to look at the fit statistic, the RLH, and they're going to identify a cutoff below which they think uh, they're more likely to find random respondents than good respondents, good valid human respondents. Uh, there's another method they're going to look at, uh, creating latent class, creating latent class models, and they're going to mix the respondents and the robotic, the, the robotic and human respondents there, and then they're going to run latent class multinomial logit with lots of classes. And if there's classes that contain a majority of random respondents, they're going to throw out all the respondents in that class uh, because they're going to say, well, these are automated. You know, we know that some of, a lot of these, this is where a lot of random robots are. The other people in these classes are likely to be random humans. Let's throw them all out. And then finally, they're going to look at a scale adjusted latent class model. Uh, there's a way of running latent class analysis to constrain one of the classes to have a zero scale, which implies random choosing. And, uh, Okay, so those are the two, those are the three methods they're gonna be looking at. And uh, go, go to the next slide. The gap that they identified in the research is that in previous papers, we've pretty consistently found that the RLH method works the best. Um, but we, we identified best in terms of, you know, I, correctly identifying random respondents. And what the, uh, the current research says is, well, really we should be focused on not so much uh, worrying about whether someone's identified or not, as worrying about whether we're removing noise from the analysis. So their criterion is gonna be, are we removing uh, you know, signal or are we removing noise when we're trying these three methods? And that's what they're gonna look at rather than misidentification, okay? So again, the three methods they looked at, they, they're gonna look at the RLH only method. They're gonna look at combining the, uh, the RLH with the latent class 
analysis. And they're also going to look at combining RLH with the scale adjusted latent class method. And they've gone, they then went through a lot of slides um, showing results and so on that I'm, that I'm going to summarize very simply. Uh, first off, they found that the RLH only method and the RLH plus scale adjusted latent class perform similarly well and better than the RLH plus just the regular latent class. And to a large extent, these two methods identify the same respondents as being the random responders who should be removed. And given that the two methods uh, perform about equally well, and uh, they, they, they thought, why add the, the, you know, the additional complexity of the scale-adjusted latent class? Uh, it just didn't seem, for, for the effort that it caused, it didn't seem to add a lot of value. And so they, they ended up concluding, as earlier papers had, that the RLH uh, method is the way to go if you want to remove random responders. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Keith. The next presentation that we want to highlight was one delivered by folks at uh, GFK, specifically Alexandra Chirilov and James Pitcher. They've talked to us about brand trackers and inserting and trying a conjoint brand tracker um, in addition to or instead of a traditional brand tracker. Um, most of you are familiar with brand trackers, which <clears throat> over multiple waves, say month after month, contact respondents and ask them what brands they're aware of or what brands they prefer. Uh, but they wanted to investigate whether if in a month by month brand tracker, if they ask respondents to complete a conjoint survey, if that could do any better or just about the same as a traditional brand tracker. They did a validation study that uh, covered a lot of respondents and a lot of uh, three categories washing machines, laptops, and TVs in Europe, in Germany, and the UK, looking at 16 monthly waves of data where there were 200 respondents in each cell in each wave. And of course, the two cells are gonna be whether they get a conjoint tracker or whether they get a, just a traditional brand tracker where they're asked what brand they prefer. Here are the respondents that would get the uh, conjoint tracker. They would see a, a number of choice tasks like this where brand, and they've got nice little logos here, and prices, uh, reasonable market type prices are being shown for these brands. And of course, respondents can pick none if they don't like that. And respondents also were selected sometimes to get stated preference trackers. So you got 200 respondents per wave doing conjoint preference tracker, stated preference tracker, and they were going to compare the results against a validation data set that GFK has called their POS panel, which is supposed to represent real market shares for these um, categories. So they went through a lot of uh, explanation and we're going to cut straight to some conclusions that uh, Keith and I took away. Their conclusions were that uh, conjoint predicts market shares better than just the stated preference question for brands. And they said, well, why could that be the case? And they said, well, in conjoint, we ask people what brand they would prefer when that brand is shown at a specific price. And rather than just asking people to just state what brand they would prefer, because maybe you know, people are just aspirational and would state a brand that they can't afford, or they don't realize the prices that are realistic to the real world. So that's why they thought that the conjoint predictor, that the conjoint predictions from the monthly waves of conjoint data um, did a better job of predicting their panel, their um, POS market share panel data than the stated preference, um, the stated uh, preference for brands. Also, they looked into whether they could make their conjoint predictions even better. They looked at, um, for the 200 respondents per wave that got the conjoint study, whether they could adjust the market simulator to account for both uh, differences in distribution for the brands and differences in awareness. Many of you are aware that Satu Software offers distributional corrections and adjustments for both uh, uh, channel distribution uh, and uh, adjusting for awareness. And they found that the adjustment for distribution helped the conjoint predictions, but adjusting for awareness did not for their data sets. Furthermore, they looked at the stability of the tracking results wave over wave, and they found that the conjoint, uh, that the conjoint predictions of brand preference were slightly more stable over time than just the uh, reporting of the other 200 respondents in each wave's stated preference. 
With that, I'll turn it back to Keith to review the next paper. Thanks, Brian. So this is a paper from Ming Shan at Kinetic, and it's about the Van Westendorp price sensitivity model and applying new statistical methods. I, I thought this was a really cool paper. Uh, like a lot of practitioners, I end up doing uh, this Van Westendorp price sensitivity meter quite a bit. And anytime anyone can suggest an improvement, I'm all ears. And so if you've worked with the Van Westendorp price sensitivity meter, that's the PSM here at the top of the page, you'll recognize those four questions. Uh, at what price do you experience product X as too cheap, cheap, expensive, or too expensive? Um, Van Westendorp was an, a Dutch economist and, uh, and, and the, the, it's sort of a naive armchair quarterback version of a pricing model, I've always thought. I never, never put a lot of stock into it. But a few years back, uh, Newton Miller Smith, that's NMS here, added two additional questions that turned it into a volumetric pricing model. Uh, and I thought those were really valuable additions. Ming's going to add a further suggestion, uh, which is uh, actually he's going to add a set of further suggestions. So, but before we go there, let's briefly review what, what uh, the Van Westendorp model gives us. So the basic, you go to the next slide. The basic price sensitivity meter uh, involves plotting these cumulative curves and these upside down cumulative curves and looking at some intersections and giving the intersections some fancy names like the indifference price point or the optimal price point or the point of marginal cheapness and things like that. <clears throat> In the end, you end up with a pretty qualitative interpretation of, well, the, the ideal price is probably somewhere between the two exterior intersections there. So maybe somewhere between about 25 and $70 on this chart. What Newton Miller Smith did, next slide, is they added some purchase intention questions that, that I showed you a couple slides ago. And that allows us to, to look at the Van Westendorp information uh, volumetrically, to look at where the revenue uh, is likely to be maximized. And so we can draw these revenue maximization curves, uh, which I find to be a, a, lot more, a lot more credible. So that's sort of the background that Ming's working with here. And he says, you know, really all we've got are some stated questions here, but they're amenable to some interesting statistical analyses. So the first one that he recommended is on the following slide here, these cumulative uh, curves um, could all be modeled using survival analysis, right? So, so Ming says, we don't have to just, you know, because if someone gives us the data, we don't have confidence intervals. We don't have, we can't do any stat testing with it. Uh, there's a limited amount of what we can do. But if we, if we build each one of these into a survival curve, uh, then we've got confidence intervals. We can do stat tests and, and we can do other, uh, other, uh, other functions that he didn't show in his presentation. But he says, you know, that, that would be, it would be valuable to kind of maybe smooth this out a little bit. Uh, and put a function in there. The other, the other thing that he noted on the next slide is that uh, Van Westendorp, despite the fact that he was an economist, there's something very non, uh, there's something contrary to, to economic theory that goes on in this Newton Miller Smith here. And that's that they, they ask uh, purchase in 10 questions at the middle two price points, the, the expensive price point and the, and the cheap price point but not at too expensive because they assume that purchase probability is zero at too expensive. And they don't ask it at, at uh, too cheap because again, they assume that, that the purchase intent at too cheap is zero. In economic theory, if something gets really, really cheap, more people buy it. If you give it away free, lots of people take it. And that's specifically not built into here. And so what Ming says is that you, you were, we're probably overstating uh, you know, the, the point of maximum revenue if we're ignoring the fact that there's huge volumes to be had here at low prices. So go to the next slide. What Ming suggested, oh, and for one thing, Ming suggested, you know, at zero dollars, maybe purchase probability is, is closer to 100%, right? So uh, I, I think that all by itself is, is an interesting addition. Maybe instead of those two Newton Miller Smith questions, we ask three and we ask people how many would buy it if it were free. And we build that into the volumetric equation. On top of that, Ming said, well, as long as we're building statistical models here, you know, once we make 100% be the, uh, the purchase probability at $0, uh, now we can start fitting a Weeble distribution to that, uh, to, 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 that, uh, to that volumetric distribution. And we can look at our, you know, to, to that uh, take rate and we can look at it like this. And he says, you know, we can use mixed models. We can get better estimates. In fact, on this slide, what he's shown uh, the light lines there are each individual respondent's curves, and the three dark lines are the curves of three different segments. He says we could really throw this in and do some segmentation based on the way they answer those questions. 
So next slide. So by way of conclusion, he said, look, you know, we can improve these questions with, with you know, we can make them, uh, give them a better statistical foundation and ground them in statistical theory if we build some, uh, if we add survival analysis and these Weeble distributions. Um, and he thought that ways of asking those questions, maybe specifically adding a third Newton Miller Smith question uh, could really be, give us something that was even more realistic and more economically credible, which uh, I thought all by itself was, even if you didn't do any of Ming's fancy statistical stuff, but you just followed that one suggestion, I, I think it would improve the way we do our work. And with that, I turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Keith. The next presentation was delivered by our uh, friends at SKIM over in Europe. They talked about something they called Filter CBC, a new approach to mimic the online shopping experience. Marco and his colleagues were the uh, presenters. So what is the filter in consumer shopping and choice? Well, this is a slide that I developed. Uh, I went up to Expedia and I said to Expedia, hey, I, I wanna travel from London to Reykjavik. And I gave it some times or a date and I asked it to give me some options. And of course there are dozens of options. And so Expedia gives you this filter by section over here on the left. So after it's got all my options for travel, I can go ahead and start filtering them so that I can make a better choice quicker rather than having to scroll through all the options that Expedia gives me. And of course, you all know that this is very, very common to many types of uh, shopping experiences that we have on the web today. So filter CBC is essentially that same game. We're going to mimic that same behavior, but in a CBC experiment. And the CBC choice task might have, let's say, 100 concepts that initially are randomly sorted. And we could use Sati Software's program to ask for 100 concepts uh, to show in each choice task. But um, probably we're only going to show the first few on the screen, like Expedia only shows the first few on the screen. And we can add a filtering tool using some fancy programming. And, and of course, Skim had the Skim folks had to do a bunch of fancy programming to customize their CBC experiment within a customized uh, fancy CBC uh, questionnaire. So that respondents can filter and potentially sort the 100 or so concepts per choice task. Now, some respondents in their experiment, they did a traditional uh, type of split sample um, study where some respondents got traditional CBC, and this is what the traditional CBC looked for their experiment, where they had, let's see, um, it looks like eight attributes in their study, and they showed six concepts at a time with no none option. So that's what the traditional respondents got in their experiment. And some respondents got this new filter CBC exercise. It covers the same attributes and levels, of course, but rather than just showing six concepts per screen, there's a lot more concepts actually being presented in each screen. Uh, four of them are being shown at a time randomly to start out, but there's a hundred concepts behind the CBC task and respondents are asked to um, go ahead and use these filters to filter the examples just like I filter in Expedia and potentially sort by different attributes as in addition to filters. And then I just pick the final product that I'm interested in choosing. So it's just a faster way to navigate a 100 concept CBC question that's supposed to mimic uh, a lot of the types of purchases and buying shopping that we do online. The feeling was that when a respondent goes ahead and, and uses filter CBC, the benefits is that we're, gonna, we're able to show more concepts per task, which is typically more realistic to shopping experiences on the web, where there's a lot of alternatives on, in the marketplace, more than, let's just say, four or five or six that we might show in a standard CBC. It also, by giving them these nice little filters, increases the likelihood that they're going to be able to navigate these dozens and dozens of alternatives in each choice task to find a suitable option. And of course, when respondents are using these filters, we can look at what they're filtering on to see how respondents are creating evoked or consideration sets. Now, how would you analyze the results from a filter CBC? And that was a big part of their paper. Option number one was just the naive way, is just to analyze it the way that you would just normally an analyze a CBC wherein each respondent 
got a hundred concepts per task. You just look at the, you, the, the algorithm observes the characteristics of the hundred concepts that were shown. The algorithm looks at one con what, which one concept was chosen. And of course does the multinomial logit steps and estimates the parameters that predict those choices. Now option two that they attempted was trickier and there were multiple ways that they described that they could do that. Essentially, they were gonna build models that not, not only look at what final choice the respondent made as in option one, but they were going to also uh, bring into the model the filtering information that led to the consideration sets um, and to go ahead and build um, one stage or two stage type consideration models that are fancier than I'll talk about here, but you can read their paper later as it gets published. The validity of the models were that they found that the standard way of modeling, the naive way of modeling filter CBC um, worked better than um, the standard CBC, okay? Because you got the respondents who just took the standard CBC task where they saw six, saw six concepts per task. You use the filter CBC and you use the filter CBC even in the naive way, and it's gonna work better than standard CBC to predict actual purchases. The remarkable thing about their study is that they followed up with the same respondents a number of months later, and they asked respondents what they actually purchased in terms of mobile phones. There were 139 possible offerings in the real world, and they wanted to see whether the conjoint analysis could predict exactly the offering that these respondents later chose. So you got two waves of data. We're going to use wave two to uh, validate the models, and we're going to find that filter CBC works a little bit better than standard CBC for predicting the actual reported purchases that the respondents in wave two made. Now there's some weaknesses to the data. Um, of course, a number of respondents fell out that they couldn't um, uh, interview in the second wave and they relied on respondents self-reported purchases about what they remembered that they had purchased. So there are some weaknesses to this, but it's really a, a neat thing to be able to report on what your respondents actually later purchased. And that's an interesting and, and great contribution of the paper. They did find that they could get slightly better models with filter CBC by considering the evoked set and um, building a, a fancier model that integrates how people make the evoked set and then choose within that final evoked set. Um, but uh, that said, it's it, as long as we can handle programming the fancy, you know, it takes some web development skills with JavaScript and so forth and custom HTML and CSS. If we can program these things, we know that just the standard um, naive way of modeling them works quite well. And if you want to go deeper and read more about the models that work even better for analyzing filter CBC, you should take a look at their paper that will be published shortly. Keith? Thank you, Brian. Okay, so the next paper is one I did with my friend Joseph White uh, at InMoment. Um, a lot of times when we approach a segmentation study, um, I think we have a good idea of how we wanna analyze the data, right? Because the data in a lot of ways sometimes ties our hands about how we're gonna run the analysis. So we know from a couple of nice papers at uh, the 2019 SOTU Software Conference that if we're, if we're gonna be analyzing uh, choice data like conjoin or max diff, and we wanna build a segmentation from it that we really need to be using uh, latent class multinomial logic. That's really the way to go. And, uh, and we know if we have a mix of different kinds of variables uh, that we don't have a lot of analysis options. So if you've got a mix of categorical and metric variables, uh, we're probably gonna end up running uh, latent class analysis uh, just because we don't have a lot of analysis options that allow us to mix variables other than that. But in, the, in what in my mind is the classic case of segmentation when we've got uh, metric data, and I, maybe it just seems like the classic case to me because the first four or five segmentations I did in my career all involved rating scales and they were all these psychometric uh, you know, segmentations. Maybe that's why it seems classic to me. But in any case, uh, when we've got only metric variables and we're only dealing with uh, percents or counts or rating scales or something like that, there's a very large number of ways we could choose to analyze our data. I think over the years, we've found that a lot of the simpler methods, like a simple k-means or a simple hierarchical uh, cluster analysis, probably aren't the best because they're not very stable. 
So what Joseph and I wanted to do is look at, next slide, uh, some robust ways of doing uh, cluster analysis when you've only got metric variables to work with, when your hands aren't tied analytically uh, because of the data you're working with. And so the five methods we chose to look at are par partitioning around metoids, uh, convergent k-means and cluster ensembles, both of which are available in the Sawtooth Software CCEA package. We found a really nice robust version of k-means in R that allows any number of sets of random starting points. And so we thought, what the heck, it runs pretty quickly. Let's try a thousand random starting points and see what see how, how well that k-means can do. And then we, uh, we used uh, model-based clustering, a, a particular type of latent class that's also available in R. And so with those, uh, with those five methods, next slide, please. We went ahead and, and we said, well, let, you know, let's imagine, let, let's, let's avoid a lot of philosophical discussion and just assume that there are such things as segments in the world, right? Marketers uh, assume that that's the case. Analysts often struggle to find them, but let's, let's pretend that we really believe that there are these things called segments and we're gonna create some artificial data sets and we're gonna know segment membership because we're building these artificial respondents. We know who's in what segment because we program them that way. But the, 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 the cluster structure in those data sets can vary in a lot of different ways. And so we created an experimental design with 48 cells based on the number of segments we were gonna look at. Is the number of segments in our data set really three or is it really five? And along how many measurement, along how many met dimensions are those segments going to differ? And again, we had they could differ each. They could differ along three, or three or five orthogonal dimensions. We looked at two levels of how separated the segments are, how how close together they are, and how hard they are going to be to tear apart. We looked at two levels of uh, segment sizes. So it could be the case that all of our segments were equal in size, or it could be the case that the kth segment was only one over k as large as the first segment. So we've got some very disparate segment sizes in the one case. And then we're gonna vary the number of variables per that we're gonna to use to measure each of those dimensions. So we might have one variable per dimension. We might have five uh, if we wanted to model something like what people do when they do tandem cluster analysis. And then we thought we would have a condition where we had one variable per dimension and an, and an additional four variables that were essentially masking variables. They're just uncorrelated with segment membership. They're just in there to mess with the segmentation technique. And we're going to evaluate our methods in terms of their ability to identify the correct number of segments and their identity and their ability to put people in the right segments. We created 10 artificial data files in each one of these cells. We have a total of 480 data sets that we analyzed. Uh, and, and each segment centroids uh, are, are located within a, a non-overlapping multivariate normal distribution. So it's really an ideal case. There really are segments here, uh, you know, and, and what you know, so we're not just having faith that there might be segments in our data. We know they're there. We built them in. We know how many they are. We know who's in which one. And we know that the segments don't even overlap. This is an ideal, it's really an ideal case. So if you go to the next slide, um, unfortunately, even though it's an ideal case, all of the methods we looked at really struggled to identify how many segments there were in the data set. Only two of the methods, the, the latent class, uh, the model-based clustering called mclust in R, and Sawtooth Software CCEA, the ensembles package, they're the only two methods that even 50% of the time identified the right number of segments. Um, the thing that really affected the method's ability to identify the number of segments was how many segments were in the data file. Uh, it had an, the, the, the algorithms had an easier time when there were three segments than when there were five. And they had an easier time when segment sizes were uh, were all equal rather than when they were badly imbalanced. Um, I guess the good news is if you do happen to get lucky and guess the right number of uh, segments, each algorithm other than PAM uh, identified at least 90% of, of the respondents correctly. And of the two, and, and of, all, of the five methods we tested, the Sawtooth Software CCEA program, the ensembles program, and that very robust version of K-means that I talked about, uh, did the best in terms of putting people in the right number of segments. Of course, none of the methods work if you get the number of segments wrong. So the big advice here is if you're doing segmentation, make sure to be wearing your lucky shirt or your lucky hat or whatever that day, because you're going to need some luck to get it right. And that, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Okay, thank you very much. 
The next presentation was really a fascinating one comparing two uh, conjoint methods that Sachi Software offers, adaptive CBC and partial profile CBC. And the fantastic thing about this research, which you'll see in the next few minutes, is that they had incredible validation data. They, they did two steps of validation data, a follow-up with a new set of respondents purely out of sample in a new context, and then actual market share once you launch the product line that you've uh, designed using the help of conjoint analysis. Our colleagues out at Diagade, together with uh, two of their colleagues, Shuming Wang and Yi Yu from Vivo Mobile Communications were the presenters. Okay, so they got lots of attributes in a study. They have 14 attributes. You know, that's, that's quite a few. Some of you guys deal in even more attributes than 14 and you say 14, that's nothing. I've done 30. But for most of us having 14 attributes in conjoint is, is, is something of a hurdle and we have to scratch our heads and figure out what to do to get good results. Two uh, going competitors for now over a decade and in the case of partial profile CBC, almost three decades have our um, partial profile choice and adaptive CBC. And our colleagues out there at Diagate compared partial profile CBC and ACBC in terms of their ability to predict what respondents and later buyers would do for smartphone choice. Now, uh, Fisher and his colleagues listed some pros and cons. These are their slides. I've ripped off their slides and I'm just showing you their slides. They said for partial profile CBC, the positives are that it's easier to program and faster for respondents, but the negatives are that it tends to understate the price importance relative to the other attributes. It's relatively inefficient to estimate and detect interaction effects. And it tends to flatten the attribute importances, create less differentiation in attribute importances across the 14 attributes, for example. ACBC, Fisher and colleagues said, had the negatives that it was harder to program the survey from a researcher standpoint, that it's longer for respondents to take the survey. And, but the positives are that it's viewed as a strong method for price measurement, stronger perhaps than partial profile CBC, and that it's stronger than uh, partial profile CBC for estimating uh, interaction effects. So how many times do we have clients that we, when we describe the pros and the cons of different methods say, say to us, test both and go ahead and present them at a conference. But this is the kind of client that uh, Fisher at Diagate had. The client says, let's go ahead and do both. So they have 14 study, 14 attributes. They did uh, two cells of research. Some respondents were asked to complete the ACBC cell and some were asked to complete the partial profile CBC. I don't know why the sample sizes aren't more balanced. I've got a follow-up question to Fisher that I wrote him this morning, kind of asking him about that. And I'll learn more about that later. Anyway, for the adaptive CBC, Fisher and his colleagues uh, programmed it using Sati Software's Lighthouse Studio, which has an option where you can add some questions before the ACBC questions where you allow respondents to screen out unimportant attributes and to screen out uh, respondents unacceptable levels prior to creating a customized ACBC where you create a customized or a constructed dynamic list and only carry forward the important attributes and the relevant levels. Because they'd done that upfront work with those prior questions, they decided that they could skip ACBC's BYO section. And ACBC allows you just to skip that section if you feel that you want to skip it. Now, for the partial profile CBC uh, experiment that they programmed, they programmed it so that four out of the 14 attributes in each task were active and varying across the concepts. They asked respondents to do 18 tasks, but rather than doing the standard way that we do in Lighthouse Studio of dropping the 10 out of the 14 attributes that are held constant in each task, they went ahead and showed them and grade them out, um, but they're still readable, kind of like ACBC grays out any concepts that are tied across the, the choice task. And they varied the held constant levels that they were using for the dropped 10 attributes across the 18 choice tasks. This is something that we haven't typically done in um, at the Sachi Software conferences, and, and but uh, academics 
often uh, use partial profile choice where they show the other attributes still held constant but grayed out. So uh, that's not something that's too foreign to academic publications. Okay, so the partial profile CBC, as I described, has four active attributes that are varying across the concepts. The other attributes are being held constant within the choice task, but they're varying the held constant levels across choice tasks. And they gray out the attributes that are held constant within the choice task. Respondents complete 18 of these. That's the partial profile CBC. Now, the interaction effect, there was an interaction effect that uh, the client was particularly interested in based upon the client's previous research and knowledge about the product category. The client said, hey, there seem to be some interesting synergies and interactions going on between the different levels of RAM and ROM. It's just not, you can't just take the necessarily, they feared, the uh, independent preference for RAM and the independent preference for ROM, as we typically do in conjoint, add them up and make good predictions. The client said to Fisher and colleagues, look out for interaction effects for this attribute. So, uh, Fisher and colleagues took the uh, ACBC data on one hand and the partial profile choice data on the other hand, and they found that ACBC found a strong interaction effect, just like the client said that they might find, but the partial profile CBC missed it. Partial profile CBC's experimental design isn't uh, nearly as strong as uh, ACBC's experimental design with respect to interaction effects, and that's probably why they missed it um, in, in their particular design setup. Now then, the client saw that the ACBC results and the partial profile CBC results um, were quite similar, but didn't perfectly line up. Uh, partial profile tended to flatten out the differences between the attributes. ACBC accentuated the differences between the attributes and also ACBC found in strong interaction uh, between ROM and RAM that partial profile missed. And so the client scratched their heads and said, well, what should we trust? What should we trust? And there was internal debate and the client said, this is important enough of a decision that let's do a follow-up piece of research. Let's just ask a new set of respondents to trade off just RAM and ROM choices. And they had just one scenario that they, sh that they showed all respondents as shown on this question to the right. Every respondent in the follow-up wave of new respondents answered whether they wanted those which of those two specific RAM-ROM combinations they preferred or whether they'd choose none of them. They tabulated the results for the follow-up respondents and it validated very tightly the ACBC prediction and was not validated as, as closely with the partial profile CBC. So this essentially gave evidence to the client that they probably should trust for this particular study and context, the ACBC results more than the partial profile CBC. So with that, the client used the market simulator using the ACBC simulator to predict what to do for a product line. The client was gonna launch two products in their series and they were gonna be going against a competitor who kept a single product in their offering. And we can see in blue what the predictions were and what the real market shares were, the relative market shares were for these three offerings when these products were launched a number of months later. This is fantastic. We hardly ever see um, actual results and how Conjoint did well. And um, it's almost eerie, it's almost scary how close the predictions are in this case. They had to have a lot of things going for them well. They had to do the research well. They had to have good sampling of respondents. They had to have a, a, a market situation to predict into with kind of uh, where all the options are, are available and a lot of, uh, of, uh, of perfect information or near perfect information in the marketplace. When those things come together, you can get really solid market predictions from conjoint analysis, as you see here. I wouldn't go to people and say every time you're going to get results this close, but this is really scarily interesting, um, amazingly close and a neat validation that conjoint can work well in many cases to predict market share. Okay, Keith, take it away. Thanks, Brian. Okay, so the uh, here's a paper on cluster analysis by uh, Evan Obakowska and Joe Retzer. Uh, 
Joe's from Act Solutions and Eva's from EY. And they always do a nice job. They've, they've done a, a lot of papers about, pres about segmentation uh, over the years at our conferences. And this is another nice one to add to the collection. I'd encourage you to take a look at this one. If you, if you get a chance to see the video or to read the paper, uh, even if you don't end up using the methods they talk about, there's some really useful stuff in this paper that you might, uh, you might find valuable. The first one, next slide, kind of, well, we go on to the, there we go, kind of sets the stage for, uh, for why they did this paper. <clears throat> if you've worked on a lot of segmentation studies, you're probably familiar uh, with this situation. Namely, your client comes to you with, with a fairly large number of, or sometimes a very large number of variables and wants you to conduct segmentation studies. Uh, Joe showed this nice, uh, nice summary of past research that showed uh, you know, the, the recommended number of observations if you've got some number P features is five times two to the P. So if you have five variables in your data set, uh, you you, you know, to have a really good luck at finding uh, segments, you're gonna need 160 respondents. If you go up to 10 variables, that goes up to 5,000 respondents. If you have 30 variables, it goes up to 5 billion respondents. So you need to, you need to interview a majority of the human race if you're gonna have 30 variables. To me, this is all by itself really handy because when a client comes to me and wants to do a segmentation with you know, 250 variables, uh, as they sometimes do, I can point to this and say, look, we can do that, but the, the, you know, the likely result is that the third bullet point here, we're, gonna, we're not gonna have sufficient data. And what our respondents are gonna do is they're, the, the different segments are all gonna look pretty much alike. Cause instead of having a large differences on a small number of variables, which you're gonna end up with is very likely small differences on a large number of variables. And you're, as a result, you're gonna have low quality segments that are not very reproducible and, and you're not gonna have great predictive accuracy. So all by itself, I think this is a really, a really cool slide. And Joe did a great job presenting it. Um, I thought so. Anyway, going to the next slide, Joe and Eva mentioned different ways of, of, of kind of dealing with this problem, right? So you, you could just uh, traditional clustering methods like k-means, all the respondents get clustered on all the features. And if there's a lot of features, well, you're just out of luck because your segments aren't going to be very different. Or you can do something called feature selection or variable selection. And there's a, there's a whole literature about this. Um, you're still going to you're still going to segment all the variables on the same subset of features, but instead of doing all 200 features, you're going to you're going to only look at a subset, maybe five or ten or fifteen of them. Uh, then they they talked about a method called COSO, which I know they presented about in the past. Uh, different respondents are going to be clustered on different subsets of uh, of features. Um, but the features aren't clustered. Uh, really, what's happening is that the features are being given weights. And then, and then the, 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 the respondents are, are, are clustered on weighted sets of features. And then the method they're gonna talk about in this paper called bi-clustering, which I had never heard of before. This sounds pretty cool. Uh, in this case, re individual respondents or subsets of respondents are gonna be clustered on different subsets of features. So segment one might be, uh, might be defined in terms of variables one, three, and five, and segment two might be uh, defined in terms of variables seven and eight or whatever. Okay, go to the next slide, please. So they noted that the original idea came from Hartigan, but it, it, it's only now, 30 years later, that we are able to start doing this method because it's computationally very demanding. Uh, they noted that bi-clustering isn't one specific algorithm, it's kind of a strategy, and that there's different algorithms uh, that, that, uh, that you can choose depending on the kind of data that you're trying to deal with, whether you've got ordinal or binary or metric data or whatever and then the structure of the bi-cluster solution. So to see more about that, go to the next slide. Uh, we, in marketing research, we really would like it to be the case that each respondent in our data set is gonna end up in one cluster, right? We don't wanna say, well, you know, J respondent Jones here is a member of cluster one and cluster five. So some of the methods for bi-clustering do this thing called exclusive row bi-clustering, which means each row, each respondent is gonna end up in a different segment. And they noted that this is gonna, this is more what our clients are expecting and it, ma it makes marketing strategy easier uh, to, uh, to formulate. And uh, it also, uh, and, and it helps having a bunch of small insignificant segments from being formed. So it's, it's for a lot of reasons. I think you're probably, in marketing research, we're probably gonna wanna go with this exclusive row by clustering. And so the algorithm that you, need, that you need to pick needs to depend on the type of data that you have and, and this desire to have an exclusive assignment for each respondent. 
The, the specific data they were dealing with was a survey of new auto buyers uh, that had a list of 45 reasons that people would, might buy, a, might, might choose a car. And the response was binary. Hey, this is an extremely important uh, reason to me or not. So everything, they had a bunch of this zero one data. And go to the next slide. So based on that, they picked the particular by clustering algorithm and uh, ran the analyses. And, and I thought of all the, the results slide they showed, this one, was, this one really tells uh, the story I thought in a good way. In both the, the far right and far left columns, you've got labels for those 45 variables that are binary. And in the dark shaded sections, it's showing um, which variables are used to define which segments. So you can see some variables like what the third, looks like the, the fourth, the fifth and sixth variables there are, are being used to define cluster one, two, and four, but not really three and five. Whereas you go two down from there, down around the seventh attribute, you've got a variable that's being used to identify all five of the segments. And you've got other variables about halfway down, you've got three variables that are only being used to identify uh, segment number two, not segments one, three, or five. So, so this is, gives you a nice visual representation of what the bi-clustering method uh, is, is doing for you. It's, it's uh, different segments. Not all the segments have to use the same variables. So it's, 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 it's a liberating thing that allows us to potentially do segmentation when there's large numbers of variables because you can see there's a lot of variables on this screen that have no dark in any row. They're basically not relevant to the segmentation solution. If you would run a k-means and leave them all in there, they will, they will affect the solution and they'll help muddy the solution for you. They'll help make your solution such that your segments aren't very different, which is not what you want to do. So anyway, I thought that's a really nice slide there. So go to the next slide, please. So their conclusions were that bi-clustering addresses the high dimensionality problem by automatically selecting subsets of features without weighting or transformation or anything like that. They wanted to let us know that there's various algorithms that are made to deal with specific data types. Uh, respondents could be classified into multiple segments if that's what we want, and by and large, we don't. And the bi-clustering segments have very high predictive accuracy, which is really neat. The one big downside they mentioned was that uh, the, it, this is so computationally intensive that it can result in a long runtime. So I asked Joe how long it took to run this analysis, and he told me four days. Now, if you know Joe, you know he has a very nice computer. Joe likes his computers, and I'm positive his, his runs faster than mine. So I, I, I worry a little bit how long it would take on mine. But then I think, how many times have I done a segmentation study where I, I give the client a solution and they're not happy with it, and we have to go back and do it again? And I can tell you the turn time on a study like that can sometimes be a lot longer than four days. So don't necessarily let that four-day runtime scare you off because I, I think it's an elegant solution that we ought, to, we ought to maybe experiment with a little bit more. And with that, I turn it over to Brian uh, for the remainder. Great. This is the last of the eight presentations that we're going to highlight. And this is the one that was voted on by the audience and confirmed by the committee to be the winning paper for the 2021 Sati Software Conference. So many congratulations to Peter Kurtz and Stefan Binner of BMS Marketing Research and Strategy. Specifically, they looked at HB covariates in hierarchical Bayes modeling, specifically for CBC type studies. For many years, um, ever since Sati Software made covariates available as a way to uh, improve, potentially improve the results rather than assuming that everybody is drawn and shrunk towards uh, uh, just a single uh, mode in a multivariate distribution, uh, we go ahead and say, hey, you know, you might have just for ease of explanation, males and females, and males essentially are shrunk more to males and females to females when we do the Bayesian borrowing of information across the sample. Well, anyway, ever since Satya has uh, created that in our package, there have been a number of presentations at the Satya Software Conference that Peter has been involved in a few of them, in which uh, the conclusions have been that the covariates enhance the heterogeneity, in other words, in separate and increase the differences between respondents, whether real or spurious, you can throw in random uh, covariates and respondents will random or spuriously essentially separate on those um, covariates a little bit more in the distribution. Uh, research has found that covariates lead to um, appropriate Bayesian statistical tests, for example, for differences between groups of respondents. And academics have said, hey, covariates really aren't for trying to improve predictive validity. Covariates are more for better um, explaining and making inferences about the data and doing statistical tests. 
Okay, so that's what for many years we've come to accept at the Saatchi Software Conference, but Kurtz and Binner wanted to give it another crack, and they found some literature about a number of motivational statements to try to figure out the kinds of motivations and perceptions and beliefs that uh, that respondents come into a survey uh, or a, a buying situation um, being imbued with. Uh, these are nine just uh, semantic differential left-right questions that are fairly quick you know, to answer for any respondent that they place ahead of before the CBC questions. These questions focus, three of the questions focus on more on brands and how people perceive brands. Three of the questions more uh, focus on how people think about prices and searching for price and paying attention to price. And the last three questions are more about innovation and how people um, want to innovate with their choices versus sticking to the tried and true. So they've got these nine behavioral questions that some respondents are gonna get ahead of the CBC questions. And of course, the other respondents are not gonna get these nine behavioral questions. Now, Peter and Stefan, they opined that the uh, nine binary questions can help respondents remember their usual buying habits um, bring those to mind before they start answering CBC questions that they can, you can just analyze the nine binary questions on their own in terms of revealing the typical um, pattern and habits, brand value perceptions for different product categories that you're going to investigate. So the questions have value in their own. They could also be used um, for example, in market segmentation. So the idea is to, with this single question, a grid of nine questions, is to add information that we can use to understand shopping behavior in this segment and our, in this um, product category, but also to help with segmentation and especially with uh, hierarchical Bayesian modeling with uh, applying them as covariates. They looked at nine validation studies over two different years, and they did split sample tests in each of these nine studies over two years. Half of the respondents got this nine behavioral questions, half did not. So half of the models were able to use the um, covariates, half did not. And they did some rigorous out of sample holdout validation with these respondents. And that out of sample holdout validation is even better than in sample validation when it comes to trying to figuring out, to try to figure out whether we're improving our models. The key findings were that merely asking, but not even modeling the nine questions improves the CBC results and the real market share predictions. In a couple of cases, they had actual market shares that went along with these conjoint studies, and they were able to find that just asking the nine questions and not even including them in the model seemed to improve the CBC results. But leveraging them as covariates improves matters even further. They looked also at doing ensembles of HB models, creating multiple models and ensembling or averaging across those models to make market share predictions. And they found that um, various ways of employing these covariates could improve the results. Um, this is an example where you have 11 different models, nine models where you take each covariate one at a time and run nine HB models. The next one is a model where you throw in all nine simultaneously, plus the last model was just the regular plain vanilla estimation without covariates. Leveraging across those 11 models to make your prediction gave an even stronger prediction of out of sample choice tasks and market share. I wondered about whether this would be practical in practice uh, because adding covariates can slow down your HB runs. Well, if you add even all nine covariates, these binary covariates simultaneously in Satya Software's HB, it only triples the length of time to estimate the model. And since a typical CBC model is five minutes, you might be looking at 15 minutes instead. That's not bad at all. Very palatable for researchers in the trenches. And, you know, if, if this is true, if their results, and I, they're great researchers and they did a lot of research, but I'd love to validate this as well, because if this works, this is an extremely valuable thing that we can add very easily ahead of, at, you know, at the front of each of our CBC uh, questionnaires and potentially get better results just by virtue of even just asking the questions. So that's fascinating. Well, 
This has been a quick tour of what we saw at the 2021 conference. And because of COVID and a number of things that went on this year with travel being shut down, most of you were not able to attend the conference. And that was a shame, but we have good news that all of the presentation videos and slides are available right now at academy.satisoftware.com. If you just wanna view the couple dozen main paper, paper sessions, that's $525 access for one seat for six months. If you wanna access more from the conference, including the turbo sessions that happened in the days before the conference, as well as the CBC workshop, the total is about $1,000 for six months. If you wanna get access to everything in the Academy, which includes the European conference that we did the previous year, all of the slides and presentation videos, then you can go ahead and sign up for $1,075 for six months. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. That's the last item, $2,200 a year for all the conferences and the content we've got. So there's a lot of information at Sati Software. We love the conferences because Keith and I learn a lot each time. It's what keeps us on the cutting edge and keeps Sati Software as an opinion leader and also as experts in content analysis and max diff for the industry. And we're just gonna to try to keep on improving our software to react to and respond to the great research that continues to go on. Last announcement is that the 2022 Sati Software Conference will be held in Orlando, Florida, May 4th through 6th. We've already made the call for papers, so I hope you've seen in your emails the call for papers. Uh, if, if you haven't seen the call for papers yet and you're interested in participating, please write me. Um, you can write uh, us at support at satisoftware.com or you can write me directly at brian at satisoftware.com. Thank you. We went a couple minutes over. I'm sorry about that. Uh, we were looking for 50 minutes, but we went a few minutes over. And I'll and we'll go ahead and uh, close the, the webinar at this point. We thank you for your attendance. And please write us if you have more follow-up questions than we were able to answer in the Q&A sessions that went along. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith, and bye-bye.